is going to be focusing on how we can learn to run with confidence. So let's pray and then ask God's blessing on our time and ask for our own humility. Father God, give us open ears ready to hear your word, ready hearts ready to desire your word, and ready wills to go and apply your word today. Give me clarity of thought and speech, and may you grab our attention. May this not simply be something that we gather together, because that's what we do. We go to church on Sunday. But may you transform us into being your people and help us to grow in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Question for you today is, do you have faith? And you're like, that's not what it says at the top of my bulletin. It says, got faith. Because you remember that old commercial for milk? Got milk? Well, one, I was just at a conference in November, and the speaker, after he'd spoken a couple of times, his last message, he says, do you trust me? Now, uh, all pastors know that you have to start your sermon with an introduction or an illustration. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so we knew what was coming. And he said, do you trust me? And so he got, raise your hand if you trust me, and almost all of us raise our hand. And he's like, all right. And then he grabs something from the, pul the pulpit. It's a rat trap. And all you need to know about a rat trap is it's just a mouse trap, but bigger. Because <laughs> rats are like mice, but bigger. And so he takes that rat trap and he sets it, and he takes a ruler, smacks it, and it snaps onto the ruler. And then he asks us, how many of you trust me? And all of us like, oh, we know where this is going. <laughs> so a few still raised their hand, and so he started walking around. He said, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and he resets the trap. He says, I want you to spring that with your finger. So he walks up to a pastor and he goes, do you trust me? And this guy's like, no. <laughs> and I'm sitting there in my seat like, pick me, pick me. So he walks up to another one and he says, do you trust me? And the guy goes, hey, pick Aaron. <laughs> he told me later, he's like, I could tell it. It was in your eyes. You would have done it. And it would have ruined the illustration. So, but he basically was asking, can you actually trust me? To not hurt you. And he, he said, I promise I won't hurt you. But it kind of shows us that sometimes there's a difference between knowledge and faith. There's a difference between something that we know and something that we believe and therefore apply. This was actually seen, for instance, there's a guy who was, he was tight walk, tight rope being across, tight rope being that was, anyway, he's tight, tight rope walking. That. <laughs> Tag uh, across Niagara Falls. And he says, how many of you think I can do it? And everyone cheers, yeah, go for it. And he walks there and he walks back. And he says, hand me that wheelbarrow. And he hands him the wheelbarrow and says, how many of you think I can do it? And they're like, yeah, go for it. Because you, know, you fall off a well. lot. But he... <laughs> he walks across with the wheelbarrow and he walks back. And he goes... How many think I can do it again? And they're like, yeah, yeah. He goes, who wants to get in? <laughs> Hebrews 11, really, if you would think about it, I think it's faith on trial. Hebrews chapter 10, or 1 through 10, is the theological trustworthiness of Jesus Christ and faith in him. He goes back over and over and over again, looks in Scripture, and says, you can trust Jesus Christ. You can trust that he's real. You can trust that he is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. And it's all these theological truths. But now it gets down in chapter 11, where the rubber meets the road. And I really think that this way, as he goes here, as he names all of these people, what he is doing is he's calling them to the stand. So we're going to even think about the Rittenhouse trial recently, where they're constantly calling witnesses to the stand. And what he's going to do is he's going to take people of the Old Testament and ask the question, can faith actually make it in practical life? Can you, as a 21st century person, actually live by faith in Jesus Christ. Is that actually human? Written a long time ago. It's been translated over and over and over again. I can't actually believe it. One sermon is not going to answer all your questions. I mean, faith is used, and there are only 260 chapters in the New Testament. So as we look at our sermon in a sentence, you realize, first of all, that faith is. Faith is. In, chapter, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You think about it, faith is like the engagement ring. It's the substance of the thing hoped for, which is the wedding day or eternal life. It's the sixth sense, if you would. 
Faith is what looks to the future. Faith is not sight, it is foresight. The man or woman of faith will hear, see, feel, taste, touch, smell things that those without faith cannot. I found it interesting, even that I thought about scripture, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You do that by faith. It says, they will discover that the prayers of the saints are a sweet-smelling savor to God. Have you ever thought, prayer is useless? It feels like my prayer never gets above the ceiling. By faith, we go, it's a sweet-smelling savor to God. And I love this verse because it's challenging to me and often one I need to go back to. Paul, in Acts chapter 17, is talking to all these people, and he says that God desired that all men would reach out for him, and then he adds this, but actually God is not far from any one of us. And so it's the feeling we reach out for God. Faith is the confidence that one day eternal and ultimate joy will be realized with God. And John Piper says, faith tastes that future joy now. And it's actually seen in the animal world. You've seen it, where they have confidence in something to come, even though they don't have it yet. I saw it just the other day. I was walking with Elise. We're walking down First Street, and squirrels are fascinating. One, because they basically rip my arm out. Because my dog loves them. <laughs> so she sees a squirrel, she's gone. But we're walking along, and I see the squirrel really, really high, and it's up on a wire, and it's running along, and, and then I see it in a tree, and it's running up, and I'm like, where is it going? Because it climbed way up high in the tree, and the next tree is about an eight-foot drop. And you know what that, faith, that squirrel does? It jumps! It has faith in the thing it hopes for. Is it blind faith? No. It says, I, I look to the future, and then lands on there. Spurgeon actually said, you, have, you see faith in the spider. Because the spider shoots out its web, expecting it to cling on to something. And so faith is the substance of things hoped for. If faith is not simply blind. It's believing something in the future and living based on it in the present. Years ago, when I proposed to Emily, if someone said, hey, how do you know that Aaron's going to marry you? She'd be like, because <laughs> I have a substance of what I hope for. You hoped for that wedding, didn't you? She answered yes silently. We, we communicate telepathically. <laughs> Faith, though, is what is honored about the past. Faith is honored about the past. Look at verse 2. By it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. And I just want to practically ask you, don't you respect people who live by faith? Don't you respect people who aren't caught up in everything that this world has to offer? Who have somehow seemed to actually believe scripture and to look through all that this world has to offer and actually live daily by faith. It says here that it's, it's how they receive their commendation. And commendation or good report here has two meanings. It means to be a witness or to receive a good testimony. And the righteous person who is full of faith has a personal witness of the Holy Spirit that strengthens him to go from faith to faith. And they're remembered for their faith. Hebrews chapter 11 has often been called the hall of faith because it's like walking down an art gallery. And you see each individual picture, and each of them have different aspects of faith. And that's it. that encourages me, because it tells me that Ken and Kathy, their portrait of faith is going to look different from Emily's and Troy's. And it's going to look different from us. But all of it is learning to walk by faith. It's kind of the golden strand, if you would, weaving all believers throughout history together. And it's the unity of the faith that we're called to. But, as you probably figured, our main point for today... His faith is what is honored about the past and is most needed for today. It is most needed for today. Look at verse 3. So he says, this is what was honored in the past. By faith, people of old received their commendation. And verse 3, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We believe that God created the world ex nihilo. Out of nothing. That takes faith. When's the last time you created something out of nothing? But it says in verse 6 that without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seeks him. This is really practical. Okay, So don't get all caught up in the language and say what in the world does that mean? 
If I believe that Bob exists, this is why when you sit in the front, maybe I should pick on someone else. No. If I believe that Bob exists and that Bob wants friendship with me, the way I'm going to draw near to him is by actually believing that. Now, if I believe that Bob's not real, by the way, Bob's the guy up in the front. <laughs> if I don't believe that he's real, I won't draw near to him. And so he says, if you don't even believe that God is real and that he actually rewards you, that you actually can draw near to God, then you're not going to. And you're not going to honor him. And so we see here a couple of pictures as we think about faith is most needed for today. But what are we called to have faith in? Just a minute, I'll get to those pictures. What we're called to have faith in is God is the creator of the world who made it all out of nothing and that God rewards those who draw near to him. We are in a generation of doubt. Did you know that? Everything is disbelieved. And I know some of you maybe are living under a little bit of a rock, but I want to tell you about how Gen Z is making fun of you. Okay? Gen Z is not me. They're younger than me. I'm now old <laughs> in their eyes because anyone older than them is. But anyway, Gen Z has started a new trend to make fun of conspiracy theories called birds aren't real. And the conspiracy is that birds are all government agents that are spying on us. <laughs> They're all secret hidden cameras. But the idea is we're, we constantly doubt. How much confidence do you have in social media posts, in the news? Like there's an erosion of confidence in anything. And it's most needed for today. The first is essential to believe that God created the world. Because think about this. This struck me this week. If God can't create the world out of nothing, how can he create new life out of nothing? Because one of our claims is that Jesus Christ died on the cross because of our sins, and that by faith in him, we receive eternal life. We receive new life. We call it being born again. And it's out of nothing except for deadness comes life. It's not like God takes our soul and then just revamps it. We, we call it new life. If God can't create the world, how in the world can we have confidence that God actually creates a new heart in you? Do you believe that you have a new heart? That God has created that by faith in him? And so that's why I think faith in Christ as creator is absolutely necessary. And the second part is essential because once we become a child of God, we must believe he desires to be known and to reveal himself. But, and you can take this to the bank or write it down, the object of your faith determines the outcome of your faith. The object of your faith determines the outcome of your faith. It's not simply having faith in faith. Or one of the things I hear really commonly is, well, I, I believe that there is a God. It's what are you actually believing in? As you think about these pictures, the Niagara Falls is beautiful, but in the middle of this beauty, there's also a danger. On average, 20 to 30 people die yearly by going over the falls. And Charles Spurgeon, an old-time preacher, called the king of preachers. Anytime I quote Spurgeon, I feel like David Jeremiah did this morning. He was quoting David, or Dr. Tony Evans. He's like, I can't quote it as good as he did. But he shares this story about one time when someone died going over the falls. He says this, some years ago, two men were in a boat, and they found themselves unable to manage it. It was being carried down in the current swiftly. And they had to get out of it, or they were going to go over the falls. And one guy, there were, there were some people on the shore, and they threw him a rope. And so the guy in the boat, he jumps out and he grabs the rope at the exact same time. A massive log floated by the other guy. And he jumped out of the boat and he grabbed a hold of the log. Well, guess what happened? The one guy who was holding on to the rope was pulled safely to shore. The other guy who was holding on to the log went over with the log. And so here he had confidence in something that was strong, but he had confidence in the wrong thing. Spurgeon's conclusion is faith has a saving connection to Christ. Christ is on the shore, so to speak, holding the rope. And as we lay hold of it with the hand of our confidence, he pulls us to shore. But our good works have no connection to Christ and are drifting along down the gulf to despair. No matter how tightly we grip anything besides Christ, even with hooks of steel. They cannot help us even a little bit. They are disconnected. They are the disconnected log, which has no anchor on the heavenly shore. So that's why it says that many will say to him in that last day, Lord, Lord, didn't we grip all this faith, 
all these things by faith because I never knew you. And so faith is, first of all, the cleansing power for sinners. The cleansing power for sinners. If you want to turn there with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, this is page 940, 941. Romans chapter 3, we have it here as well. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through what? Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified. They are made right with God. They are made righteous by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward is the propitiation or the wrath removing sacrifice by His blood. To be received, how do you receive that sacrifice? By faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, parents know exactly what forbearance is, don't you? Bearing along with your children. He had passed over former sins. It was to show God's righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has what? Faith in Jesus Christ. And so the way that we were cleansed from our sin was by faith. At the Jerusalem Council, Paul said that the Gentiles, which is us, were cleansed and their hearts were cleansed by faith. And in chapter 26, he's given his testimony. And he said, my job is to help others receive the forgiveness that comes by faith. And that's part of my job, is to help you receive forgiveness that comes by faith. But think about this. If you have been cleansed from your sin, you were cleansed by what? Faith. By faith. That's right. And if you want to be cleansed from your sin, you must be cleansed by Christ. Now, by faith in Christ. And if you have a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker or a family member, a mother, father, husband, child... Who you want to be cleansed from their sin. And even as we've been talking more about how do we have gospel conversations, if we want our neighbors to be saved, they have to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's the cleansing power for sinners, which is good news because the ground is even at the foot of the cross, right? All of us come on by the same way, is by faith in Jesus Christ. The Jews actually missed being able to be cleansed because they tried to cleanse themselves. And this this jumped out to me. It's possible to pursue obedience to the death because it's not pursued in faith. Let me say that again because that, that really hit me. It's possible to pursue obedience to the death. Do you know anyone that's super religious but not saved? People, you know, they go to church religiously. And that could be some of you here. Just because you got Baptist in the name does not make it any different of how you get to heaven. They go to church. Maybe they read their Bible. Maybe they pray the prayers they're supposed to pray. But li listen to this verse, Romans 9, 3 through 3, 3. What should we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue the righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. Why are Jews who do not believe in Jesus Christ not saved? Because they're pursuing the law without faith. It says they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as is written, Behold, I am laid in Zion, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So it's actually possible to pursue to the death obedience. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. And so it's the cleansing power for the right, or for sinners, but it's also the currency of the righteous. It's the currency of the righteous. And yes, these are all C words that are fill in your blanks. It's the currency of the righteous. It says we are called to pray in faith, to walk by faith. And we're told that God has made the poor in the world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of heaven. And so it's actually possible to feel far from God, but by faith to cling to him. I don't know if you're like me. I know some of you are not like me. <laughs> and I know some of you are. But sometimes we believe this lie. If I don't feel it, it isn't real. And so we believe this lie that if I don't feel close to God, I must not be. And so what ends up happening is we worship and serve the creature of feeling over the creator. But listen to this quote by Eugene Peterson. 
Feelings are great liars. Now I want to stop there because otherwise I'll read ahead because I do when I sit in the chair. Feelings are great liars. Do you know that to be true? Have you ever felt something that was false about your spouse? About your parents? About your kids? Let's go on. Feelings are great liars. Feelings are important in many areas, but completely unreliable in matters of faith. The Bible wastes very little time on the way we feel. We think that if we don't feel something, there can be no authenticity in doing it. But the wisdom of God says something different, namely that we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. You ever heard someone divorce and they said, I fell out of love. Because the feeling was gone. What God says is that the righteous can actually act themselves in new ways of feeling. And I actually discovered that to be true with something called coffee. I acted my way into feeling something very strongly about coffee. I used to hate coffee. And I I hated coffee breath. So now if I talk to you a little bit farther, it's because I have it. <laughs> I hated coffee breath. I hated how bitter it was. I was like, why would you drink anything that literally makes your entire mouth go, ah! like my, my mouth would scream when I ate it. And I remember going out to out to coffee and everyone was going out to coffee. And I was like, can we go get a donut or a sub or something else besides coffee? And I went out with my friend and I said, I want something on the menu that doesn't taste like coffee. He goes, try a latte. I tried a latte and I just about died. It was so bitter. I was like, this is so awful. But then we had a kid. And I went from eight hours of sleep a night to like six. And yes, my wife got even less than that. It's true. But all of a sudden, I found out a reality of coffee, which I had grown to love. It has this thing called caffeine in it. <laughs> and I drank, I went from cappuccino, which is basically straight sugar, to half a cup of creamer and half a cup of coffee, to a quarter cup of creamer and third of three-fourths a cup of coffee. I'm going to stop doing math, otherwise I'm going to get in big trouble. <laughs> so now, I can drink coffee almost all day if it didn't give me a headache. I used to feel like coffee was awful. Feelings are great liars. And I just want you to consider, are there feelings that you have about God that are lying to you? Are there feelings that you have about the Word of God? One of the things I, I, I catch is people say, I can't possibly understand it. Really what they're saying is, I, I don't feel like I can understand it. Do you have feelings about prayer that are not true, that there are liars? You see, it's the currency of the righteous. We begin to walk by faith. And so it's also the companion of the righteous. Not only is it the currency, the way that we interact with God, but the companion, the one who goes beside us. Companion is defined by Webster as an intimate friend or a comrade. Someone you can lean on and trust in, a faithful friend. God is so designed that each Christian is given a companion fit for him or her, and his name is Faith, to come alongside of us. It says in Scripture, two are better than one, and so we have faith without works is dead. But then it says a threefold cord is not easily broken, and now by three things. You remember what they are? Faith, hope, and love. But the grace of these love. So faith in Christ is the cleansing power for sinners. That's the beginning. Faith in Christ is the conquering power for saints. That's the middle. And it's the comforting power for sufferers. That's the end. And so faith is with us along the entire journey. And that's why I like the verse that I quoted recently, Galatians 3. Paul says, Are you so foolish, having begun in faith, are you now perfected in the flesh? And I know personally, sometimes I get like that. Where it's like, I, do you ever do things that you know you shouldn't? Do you ever not do things that you know you should? I did this morning. There was someone sitting out here in the car, and I was prompted, hey, go up and see who they are and invite them into church. They're gone. I have no clue if they were planning on coming to church or if they weren't. But I didn't go over, and now they're gone. And so many times, 
we, we have things that we know that we ought to do and we choose not to. And so we have to realize that it is the conquering power for saints. I don't preach just out of my own strength. It's got to be faith that God's actually working in you. Do you know that I have to get up here and believe that God's going to use his word in your life to actually change you? And I'm praying for some of you real hard. <laughs> Myself included in that. But then it's also the comfort for sufferers. Warren W. Rusby said the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And the battleground is faith. And so Paul urges us to fight the good fight of faith. Take up the shield of faith with which we will just extinguish the fiery darts of the devil. I say that many Christians today walk around wounded, cut, and burnt by Satan's arrows because we loosened our grip on faith. We stopped believing the promises of God. We stopped believing that what he says is true. And we got hit with bitterness, with anger, with lust. And so if that's you, strengthen your grip. I've often thought about how weak my faith is and felt like I was stuck in weak faith. But guess what? It's God who works in us, giving us the desire for stronger faith and the power to do that. So check out these verses. I found these encouraging. It said, the, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. One of my least favorite things about sermons on faith is when they basically tell you to have more faith and then they leave it at that. Like, there, there are good Christians who are up here who always have faith and they always walk by faith and they're always praying and they're always believing the Word of God and every day is a great day because they got faith. And then there's you. <laughs> and that's how I feel about after almost every faith sermon. And then I, go, I, I thought, huh. The disciples said, increase our faith. And Paul says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith as they increased in numbers daily. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 For what thanksgiving we return to God for you, for the joy that we feel for your sake before God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see your faith to supply what is lacking in your faith. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers. It is right, because your faith is what? Growing. Is faith something that you're supposed to just reach and attain and stick at? Or is it a mountain you climb? And that encouraged me because oftentimes I feel like I'm at the bottom of the hill. And if good, successful Christianity is at the top of the hill, I'm awful. <laughs> I'm stuck down here. But our faith can grow. And so I hope that encourages you. If you find yourself today, you're like, I don't believe things. And I, my prayer life's in shambles. My time with God is in shambles. I read scripture. I come to church. I hear this. And I want to believe that. And I don't. One of the things I'd really encourage you to do is pray with the disciples that Lord, increase our faith. God, increase my faith. And then open your Bible to mine. Say, God, give me faith to believe your word. <laughs> to walk by faith, again, Wearsby says, is to obey the Lord no matter our feelings, our circumstances, or our consequences. But do you remember how I said that it is the comforting power for sufferers? It's the cleansing power for sinners, that's the beginning. The conquering power for saints, that's the middle. That's what we're in. It's also the conquering power for sufferers. Listen to this letter from blogger Tim Challies. His son was at college studying to be a pastor and he suddenly died. They didn't expect it at all. And I want you to see if you can pick up faith, even though it's never mentioned. It says, oh my Nick, I miss you so much. It's been 203 days since I hugged you goodbye. 124 days since I spoke with you. 102 days, 22 days. Since he went to heaven. It all feels so long but also so short. And I expect the same will be true of the time that elapses between today and the day that we're back together. The sage says life is like a vapor, a breath, a puff, a whisper. I'm more mindful of that than ever. And each day is precious. Each day is a gift to be used for good of others and the glory of God. So I prayerfully discern each day's duty and carry it out as best I can. Then when night comes, I fall asleep thinking, when I wake up, I'll be one day closer to Nick. And if I don't wake up, I'll finally be with him. He believed that one day he would be with his son. And he gave him comfort to do the day's duties. Do you see a dad here in the fetal position, incapable of going on with life? No. It comforted him in his suffering. And so it's the companion of the righteous. 
says in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. So I encourage you to be strong in the faith, because the final thing is the cork. Faith is the cork of end times. It is the cork of end times. When the end comes, there will be very little faith. It says in Luke 18, 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And the assumption to the rhetorical question is no. Faith will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what do we live? How do we, how do we put this into practice? We need more faith. Do you have faith? I can't even hardly say got faith, but the question is, do you have faith? How do we live based on it? Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I'm asking you, do you have faith? You got faith? Because it's impossible to please God without it. But the second thing is I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Or 1 and 2, I mean, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses to faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance, with confidence, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and what? Perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus had faith, Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. And Christians, we grow weary and we grow faint-hearted, don't we? But we need to run with confidence, and we can, because of having faith in God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. But even in that, we are not left alone, because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So I hope that as you go out today, your faith is strengthened. And if you go out and you're like, I believe that to be true, but I don't feel it to be true, I hope you go and you apply the sermon and you say, I'm going to act my way into feeling instead of just trying to feel my way into acting. Father God, please help us to put this into practice. Uh, the robber is going to meet the road when we get home in our are we going to believe that your way is life? 